the current era when antibiotics are, are mostly effective could disappear. It's possible that our children or our children's children will look back in 2050 or 2080 and say, goodness me, the, the period from 1930 to 2030 was a golden age when we actually had effective treatments against common infections. Now I hope that won't happen, but that's the kind of scenario that we're looking at. A Palm Catholic Hospital in Ghana is like many district hospitals across the developing world, serving more than 200,000 people with 105 inpatient beds, it doubles up as a primary care facility. Hundreds of people come every day to its outpatient department. Halifa is a nurse in this busy part of the hospital, but recently she's had health problems of her own. Uh, I started feeling headache, having headache, stomach ache, feeling feverish. And then when it's in the evening, I feel cold. So f first, I thought it was malaria. I took malaria treatment, but still. So I reported to the hospital, and then they asked me to go for lab. They told me I have typhoid. A palm has a critical shortage of drinking water and extremely poor sanitation. Typhoid, cholera, and other diarrheal diseases are endemic, and Halifa's treatment is proving difficult. They gave me Sipu. I feel a little bit relieved for some times. But then two, three months later, I feel the same thing. And then when I went for the lab, it went higher than the first one. So they gave me Sipu again. In fact, to cut it short, I have taken Sipu for about, let's say five times. Halifa's drugs aren't working. Her typhoid infection seems to be drug resistant, and she's not alone. Typhoid resistant to ciprofloxacin and other antibiotics is found across Africa, Asia, and South America. Chloroquine resistant malaria, which first emerged in Southeast Asia in the 1950s, now plagues all the world's malarial zones. And extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, which is virtually untreatable, has been confirmed in at least 58 countries. In the poorest countries of the world, where infectious diseases are prevalent, drug resistance is on the rise. Weak health systems cannot cope, and patients suffer as a result. Children are often the worst affected when drugs stop working. Children are more likely to die rather quickly if they have a systemic bacterial infection like bacteremia or typhoid fever. And so there isn't the opportunity to get it wrong and then use something else the second time around. Uh, these are very deadly diseases and with children you have the added concern that even if they recover, there's a chance that there'll be long-term damage. The impact of drug resistance is also felt economically. In Ghana, losing ciprofloxacin as a typhoid treatment is costly. If you compare the cost of treatment for ciprofloxacin, the cost will cost about uh, three Ghana CDs, close to three dollars. But you look at azithromycin, the cost for treatment of a seven-day course of the drug, that's around 11 Ghana CD. Just one vial of ceftriazone costs around seven dollars. So for a seven-day course, you can just sum it up. That's the cost of resistance. The development of drug resistance is somewhat inevitable. As a disease pathogen is exposed to a drug, it mutates in response or relies on pre-existing mutations that give it a better chance of survival. Some bacteria can destroy the drug or pump it out before it has a chance to take effect. Bacteria can even pass resistance-conferring genes across species. Over time, drug-resistant strains dominate. But humans speed the process. Penicillin was identified in the 1800s and formally discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. But it wasn't mass-produced until 1944. Greeted with huge excitement, it was widely used, not always appropriately. 
Within just two years, infections resistant to penicillin were seen, as Fleming himself had predicted. Since then, this scenario has played out again and again. We spend time and money developing drugs, then overuse or misuse them. Many lose efficacy within a few years or even months. But in developing countries, this is rarely monitored, and drug-resistant disease may affect many people before it's recognized. In an epidemic such as a cholera outbreak, this can be disastrous. There was a very, very large epidemic in uh, Goma in 1994, right after the Rwandan genocide in a refugee camp. This was a case of a cholera epidemic and a concomitant dysentery epidemic. Both the bacteria were resistant to nalzixic acid, and this was the drug that was chosen for empiric therapy. It's quite probable that using that drug led to a very large epidemic. It's not very easy to test for drug susceptibility in some infections, uh, for example, HIV and malaria, but for many bacterial infections, it's a very simple and inexpensive protocol. You spread the bacteria on a plate, add a disc of antibiotics, and you can determine which bacteria are present and which antimicrobials they're susceptible to. If you know the resistance pattern in an area, you can predict which antimicrobials might be most useful. Knowledge about drug resistance is the foundation of being able to act against drug resistance. We have hospitals, district labs and national and regional labs and they need to be communicating with each other so that we can see where resistance is occurring and how it's spreading across geographic regions. In Halifa's case, it was the hospital pharmacy that noticed her treatment failure and identified a new drug. The doctor wrote uh, Cipro for me, but when I went to the pharmacy, he told me that he has noticed that I've been taking Cipro for a while. So I'm not getting better. So he changed the drug to azithromycin. So yesterday, I went for the lab again, and then it's almost the same thing. Halifa's not getting better. Her typhoid infection may be resistant to azithromycin too. Additional diagnostic and drug susceptibility tests would help her get the right drugs, but she can't get those tests done locally. We take the samples and send them to uh, Nugochi. That is in Accra. That is the only option that we have. We cannot do that test here. We need a new structure altogether, and we need a new equipment. When those things are in place, uh, we'll be very happy to start doing the sustainability test. So the clinician can know what drug to give and how to monitor the patient to take the drug. Building laboratory capacity is therefore critical. Halifa did get an initial laboratory diagnosis. This is a vital step most patients can't or don't take, increasing the risk they'll use unnecessary or ineffective medicines. Patients may self-diagnose, particularly with an embarrassing condition, such as a sexually transmitted disease. The first thing they talk about is ambine and pistolin. So you sit the person down and find out why, and then you realize it's an STD. Patients may also stop taking their drugs, particularly if side effects are unpleasant. The first time I started taking Cipro, I feel very, very ache in my abdomen. So I complained and they told me it's one of the side effects of the Cipro. So I continued taking it. But sometimes when I start taking it, it's hard, it's hard for me to even finish it. Influencing patient behaviour is hard, but dispensers can help. In Ghana, informal drug sellers are trained to tackle drug-resistant malaria. You know, Roquin was a very good anti-malaria product, but now because of the resistance, we are facing it out. They organize um, courses for us, train us on how to present the drugs and then how to dispose of the drugs, how to receive uh, our clients. Reaching out to dispensers through training, accreditation schemes, and professional associations is vital. Dispensers must be informed about proper drug use and the prevention and impact of drug resistance, as patients often go to them first for medicines and advice. 
However, even with a confirmed diagnosis, an appropriate prescription, and a dispenser offering sound advice and support, risks remain to the patient and to public health. The drugs themselves may be of poor quality or even fake. There should be no difference in quality standards for drugs anywhere in the world. There are very basic principles for ensuring quality, and those are the principles of good manufacturing practices. The quality specifications are often set in compendia. Poor drug quality really refers to a drug that does not meet these specifications, and therefore could lead to a patient taking uh, an underdose of the drug, which could ultimately lead to resistance. Drug resistance is only going to be dealt with if we look at the entire supply chain. The private sector is a key actor. They have a great interest in making sure that their drugs are protected in quality as they go through the supply chain. They also have a lot of information about how and when drugs might be compromised. So it's important that they buy in to collectively deal with this problem. But the industry cannot act alone. The drug market must also be well regulated. It is quite essential if we have in place a quality infrastructure that can keep track of quality of medicines, whether they are antibiotics, anti-malaria, those for HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis. Recently, we picked a counterfeit product on the Ghanaian market, which was well publicized, a counterfeit co -atom. One of the things we did was not only to inform the WHO, but also to inform our neighbors. It's really nice to have this regional approach, at least to share best practices uh, and be able to share knowledge so that they can all help to protect each other. Because whatever problems you have in one country, because of the porous nature of their boundaries, is bound to occur in the next. We need stronger collaboration between health professions and between countries. Another key lesson from a palm is that prevention is better than cure. When people get sick often, and so take many drugs, this accelerates the development and spread of drug resistance. Preventing disease is therefore vital, but new drugs will be needed, as are new technologies that can help us use drugs wisely and prolong their efficacy. We can't be content with the drugs that we have now. We need to be able to produce new ones, but we also need to make our drugs last as long as possible because it takes years to develop new effective drugs. We need new technologies to protect drugs directly, for example, to stop microbes pumping them out. Point of care diagnostic and drug susceptibility tests would also be valuable. We don't have those sorts of diagnostics for many bacterial infections, but the technology exists to develop them. We need to, I think, understand how we can induce the industry and the biotech sector, working with academic groups who are seeking to understand the organisms, how we can uh, facilitate a, a, an informed dialogue, credible partnerships, and that in turn will attract funding. Resistance to drugs is not only a poor country problem. Resistance to drugs affects us all. Lots of people now see the consequences of MRSA in hospitals. If you then put that on a global level and connect it to things like malaria, to TB, to HIV, issues that the public in both developed and developing countries really have begun to get behind and to really understand, then I think we can begin to integrate the issue of drug resistance into our thinking on this and to raise it up the political agenda. We need a strong global push to fight drug resistance with better information, new resistance fighting technology, coordinated regulatory action, appropriate drug distribution, prescribing and dispensing. We need to address this problem globally and we need all available hands on board to do it. We need doctors, nurses, we need pharmaceutical companies, we need health planners, we need donors, we need governments, and we need the public. The problem is clear. We know exactly what to do, what countries should do. It's just a matter of doing it. And if we sit and wait, that's fine, but at a certain moment, there's simply no antibiotics anymore. That's it. Then we're back in the 1920s. It's urgent that we respond to drug resistance now. We have the solutions, we just need to act on them.